we spent um, last time talking about how nucleic acid gets out of the particle. For the next couple of sessions, we're going to talk about how viruses uh, reprogram the cell to create more nucleic acids and proteins to make new virus particles. So today we're going to start by talking about RNA viruses and how they make more genomes and more messenger RNAs. Now, this all begins with tobacco mosaic virus, the virus, the first virus to be discovered. Remember, at the end of the 1800s, in 1935, uh, the actual particle was crystallized so that X-ray structures could eventually be made. And then a year later, it was shown that those crystals had about 5% RNA in them. This was really something new because people were wondering about whether DNA was the genetic material. And here, these viruses had RNA. Now, in 1944, DNA was shown in bacteria to be the genetic material. For viruses, the DNA was shown to be genetic material in 1952, the Hershey Chase experiment, which we talked about. Structure of DNA solved in 1953. Uh, and then in 1956, the RNA of tobacco mosaic virus was shown to be infectious. What they did was they separated the RNA from the protein, they took the RNA by itself and put it into a cell, that's a process we call transfection, and out came new virus particles. First time that RNA was shown to be genetic material, 1956. Uh, by 1959, many other RNA viruses of animals had been discovered, and then that began in the 60s, studies in laboratories to figure out how RNA could be replicated and copied. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So here's our Baltimore scheme, which I'm sure you know very well by now, with our mRNA in the middle. And in red are the viruses we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about plus strand RNA viruses, how they replicate their genomes. That's poliovirus. We're going to talk about minus or negative stranded RNA viruses like influenza virus and the bullet-shaped virus that you've seen, vesicular stomatitis virus, VSV. It's related to rabies virus. And then we're going to talk about double-stranded RNA viruses, the rheoviruses. And one of the viruses in that group is rotavirus, uh, which we talk about later because it causes gastroenteritis. Now, way back in the 60s, a graduate student right here in New York City, David Baltimore, he was at Rockefeller University. This is the guy who goes on to discover reverse transcriptase and by the age of 42 gets a Nobel Prize. It's pretty good. So he did this very simple experiment. He infected cells with poliovirus and he took samples of the medium and did a plaque assay. So here's hours after infection and on the right y-axis, poliovirus titer, PFU per mil. This is a one-step growth curve, which we looked at earlier. You see the, uh, the PFU are in dots, and you see there's an eclipse period after you infect the cells. You don't detect any infectivity. And then at two hours, you start getting lots of viruses produced. This is a crappy picture because it's a really old journal when they used to hand draw uh, their graphs, and it doesn't reproduce very well. Now, at the same time, he took a duplicate culture that he had also infected with polio. These are HeLa cells. And he added a labeled triphosphate precursor. Uh, let's see if it tells us here. Probably they used uridine. Uridine would be specific for RNA. And it's labeled with tritium. It's radioactive. And then at different times after infection, he cracks open the cells and asks, is there any incorporation of the tritium into nucleic acid? Are we making labeled RNA? And you can see at two hours, you start to make labeled RNA, and it peaks at three to four hours. So this was the first demonstration that an infected cell can produce an RNA polymerase. He also did another experiment which showed that this was a viral enzyme. He used a drug that would inhibit cellular enzymes, and they didn't inhibit this RNA production. So he concluded that this was a viral enzyme. Now, the next step he took was brilliant. So he figured this is a plus strand RNA virus. That plus strand 
could get in the cell and be translated. Therefore, it doesn't have to be, the polymerase does not have to be in the particle. This is something I told you a long time ago in this course. And then he thought, we have some viruses that have negative strand genomes. Those can't be messages, so the polymerase must be in the particle. So he took VSV and he discovered the polymerase in the virus particle. He, instead of doing the, the experiment I just told you, where you infect cells and you add label to the infected cells, he took VSV virus particles. Listen very carefully to this. He took VSV virus particles, and you can disrupt the membrane a little with detergents. You can add triphosphates, and you can have one of them labeled the uridine. And those particles made RNA because the polymerase is in the particle. And as you'll see in a bit, they make all the VSV mRNAs. So he discovered the polymerase in the particle. And uh, later on, as we got the sequenced virus genomes, we could tell what a polymerase looked, at, looked like just by aligning the sequences. And as you'll see later, there are signature amino acids like this glyasp asp GDD which are typical of polymerases. So you can look at a sequence now and say, ah, this is an RNA polymerase. We've got recombinant proteins that we can produce in cells on their own and show they have polymerase activity. We can solve their crystal structures. Now, in a couple of lectures, we're gonna talk about retroviruses and reverse transcription. And you'll see how Baltimore did another brilliant leap when he underwent the logic to figure out why those viruses have RT. But I'm not gonna tell you about that now. I don't wanna cloud your thinking with that. You have, to be, you have to have it clear for the exam, all right? So here's a review of what I've already told you. Minus strand genomes in the particle are typically coated with proteins. They have a nucleocapsid like VSV and Ebola virus. It's an RNA complex with protein. We talked about how that works. And one of the proteins is the RNA polymerase in the particle. So they bring the RNA polymerase in because the RNA can, the negative strand RNA cannot be translated. Plus strand viral genomes are typically, the RNA is naked because that plus strand can get in the cell and be translated. Now exceptions are two here, retroviruses and coronaviruses. The retroviruses, again, we haven't talked about their life cycle in detail. They, their genome is plus stranded RNA, but it gets converted to a DNA upon infection of the cell. But remember, it is a plus strand. So it could be translated, but it never gets out of the particle. All right? So retroviral genomes are plus stranded, but in the life cycle of the virus, they are not translated, they're copied to DNA. And for that, they need to be proteins coding the RNA. Coronaviruses uh, have lots of proteins on the RNA. We don't know why. It's not a polymerase because this is a plus strand. It may be because the genome is so big, it's 30 kilobases, 30,000 base pairs. It's the longest viral RNA that we know. Maybe the proteins help stabilize it uh, when it gets in the cell. So that is, those are the only two exceptions to this rule. Plus strand RNA is typically naked. And then we have double-stranded RNA genomes, real viruses. <clears throat> Can double-stranded RNA be translated? No, it can't. So these viruses have to have an RNA polymerase in the particle. However, these genomes are not coated with protein. Okay? Listen carefully. They are not coated with protein. They have a polymerase in the particle, but as you will see, it's just attached to one end of the genome. Okay. Now these nucleocapsids, the RNA protein complexes, are shown here. Two examples on the left. Here on the bottom is vesicular stomatitis nucleocapsid. So it's the RNA protein capsid wound up in a helical structure. There's a membrane around this. That's why we call it a nucleocapsid. For TMV, that's the virus, so we don't call it a nucleocapsid. And it is a protein RNA structure. Here on the top uh, is the protein in blue, and the RNA is in yellow. And there are a couple of subunits, one, two, three, four, five or so subunits, just showing you how a single nucleocapsid protein is repeated many times. Remember, it interacts with the viral RNA. The RNA is sitting in a groove in the nucleocapsid. And the proteins are also interacting with each other, one of the principles of symmetry. 
and these are all wound up to form this nucleocapsid. On the right is influenza virus. You know this virus also has a nucleocapsid. It's a negative stranded RNA virus, but it's segmented. It's in pieces. It's why you see eight pieces here. And again, these are RNA protein complexes, and you can see on the top uh, the proteins whose structures have been solved also, and there's an RNA bound to that as well. Now remember, RNA is not just a straight line as we draw it here. I always draw these green squiggly lines, but as we said way in the beginning, it has a lot of structure, and that's illustrated in this slide. On the left, in part A, you see stem loop structures. This happens when RNA can base pair with itself. So you see the red lines indicate where there are complementary bases within the RNA, so you form this stem structure. There's typically a loop at the end where there is no base pairing because the RNA has to turn to join the other part and it can't be base paired. And these can be very complicated. They can have uh, internal loops that can be bulges and they can be uh, in, in two parts, forked if you will, can, be, can get very extensive. So most RNA is like this. It's extensively structured. Uh, there's a specific structure that we'll mention perhaps in a bit or maybe later on. It's called a pseudo-knot. Pseudo-knot, K-N-O-T. It happens when bases in a loop base pair with bases downstream of the stem loop, as shown by these dotted lines in the top. So what happens when that happens, uh, when that occurs, you get base pairing, and the structure looks so somewhat like this, the second one down here. And it looks like a knot, but it isn't really tied like a real knot is, so we call it a pseudo-knot. So when you hear me say pseudo-knot, that's what I'm talking about. All right, now there's some very specific rules about nucleic acid synthesis, and today we'll talk about the RNA rules. Here's an RNA genome at the top. Uh, when you replicate a genome, when we talk about replication, making new genomes, you have to copy it from one end to another without losing sequence. Obviously, if you didn't copy it from the ends, the viruses wouldn't work anymore because you'd be losing sequences. So in replication, you need to copy end to end. You also have to make mRNAs that can be translated by the protein synthesis machinery. We're going to see some examples today where the mRNA is not the same as the genome. It varies according to the virus. You have to be really careful about that because mRNAs are not often complete copies uh, of the genome. There's some universal rules for RNA synthesis, which I think you should know if you've taken biology courses. Uh, RNA synthesis initiates and terminates at specific sites on templates. The polymerase sometimes uh, initiates without a primer. We call that de novo initiation or sometimes it requires a primer. Uh, this, the cell enzymes that make RNA from DNA templates, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase, they don't need a primer. They, they initiate at specific places, but they don't need a primer. We say that's de novo initiation. Or polymerases can be primer-dependent. So among the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, which again, are always viral encoded, RNA-dependent RNA polymerases are always virus encoded, they can be either, they can initiate either de novo or they can require a primer. Quite often, you need other proteins to get RNA synthesis. They can be viral or cellular. So even though the enzyme is always viral, sometimes it needs cellular proteins for its activity. And the RNA is made by a template-directed process. There is an RNA template, and the enzyme copies it to make a product. It incorporates DNTPs. The template is read in a three to five prime direction, but the product is synthesized in a five to three prime direction. This is often confusing, but if you just look at a nucleic acid, uh, you can figure that out. Now, most of the synthesis we're gonna talk about today is templated. That means there's an RNA which is copied by the polymerase. There is some example of non-templated RNA synthesis in the RNA world. And I will tell you an example or two about that at the very end. This is RNA that's put in or that's made without having a template. Um, and that's very interesting and gives rise to a lot of evolution. Now, in terms of initiation, again, with RNA polymerases, you can have de novo or primer dependent initiation. And these are just some examples to illustrate this for you so you understand what I'm talking about. At the top are two examples of de novo initiation. Here's our RNA in green. 
we're starting at the three prime n. We always read the template from the three prime n. And here, the polymerase is adding NTPs right at the very three prime end. It doesn't need a primer. It adds the first NTP right there, the second, and bonds are made, of course, between them to make an RNA chain. And this proceeds along the whole length of the RNA until you get it copied. Sometimes the, the initiation begins internally. So for example, uh, on this RNA, the first base to be added is a G, which is complementary to the sixth base uh, on the three prime end of the RNA, but then uh, that will slip back after the polymerase initiates on it and makes a few bases. This will slip back so that we don't lose any sequence. Remember, you have to copy from end to end, and the slip back allows you not to lose sequence. All right, on the bottom are two examples of primer dependent initiation. One is you can sometimes initiate with a couple of nucleotides linked to a protein. These are called protein linked primers. We'll see an example of that today and later on in a DNA virus. Basically, <clears throat> it provides a, a primer for starting synthesis because these enzymes are primer dependent. And we'll see today, sometimes uh, viruses use capped primers. Now, caps are structures at the five prime ends of eukaryotic messenger RNAs, and some viruses use those as primers to, make, to initiate synthesis of mRNA. And again, we'll see a specific example of that uh, today. <clears throat> now, both DNA and RNA synthesis ha are chemically very similar. Of course, there is a base difference. Instead of T in RNA, you have U. This is an illustration of how synthesis occurs for DNA, but it's essentially the same for RNA. So we have a template again. Uh, DNA synthesis, of course, is primer dependent, so we're showing a red primer here. Here's a DNA polymerase, and we're adding triphosphates uh, to the three prime end of that primer, and the chain grows uh, in this direction. So again, we're reading the template, which is in the black strand here, from three to five prime, and we synthesize from five to three prime. So both DNA and RNA synthesis uh, carry this out in a similar way. Of course, some RNA synthesis is not, temp is not primer dependent. But they both use what we call a two-metal mechanism of catalysis. So here on the right is a detail of the template so here at the top is the three prime end of a template, and you can see there's a G, a T, an A, a T, and this is DNA. If it were RNA, of course, it would have U's. Uh, and then we have um, a five prime primer on which we're adding another base. So we have already base paired the primer CG pair here. Then when the next base is an AT pair. And now we're adding another T, which is templated by that A right there. And as you will see, uh, in the polymerase, there are specific aspartate residues. Uh, there's aspartate A here and aspartate C. Their function is to coordinate the metals that are part of the two metal catalysis mechanism. The metals are magnesium, typically shown here, and they are needed for the addition of new triphosphates. So the aspartates in the polymerase hold the metals in place and then that can allow for all the nucleophilic attacks and so forth that have to occur when a new triphosphate comes in. Two phosphorus uh, molecules are released, and then you have a phosphodiester bond with a single phosphate between uh, the new, newly added triphosphate. So again, you add, you start with an NTP, a nucleoside triphosphate. The metal catalysis helps remove the two phosphates and provide energy for the synthesis of the bond between the uh, nucleoside now and the existing base. And so what you end up with is a, is a base, which of course consists of a sugar ring and a base. Uh, then you have a phosphate linked to the next <coughs> sugar ring and so forth down the line. So that's the two metal mechanism of polymerization. I'm gonna show you in a bit where those metals are located. All right, our first question is what is, which is a universal rule about RNA-directed RNA synthesis. RDRP, of course, is our uh, abbreviation for RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, may initiate de novo or require a primer. RNA synthesis initiates randomly on the RNA template. RNA is synthesized in a three prime to five prime direction, or RNA synthesis is always <coughs> template-directed. So which one is a universal rule? 
Okay, 85% of you answered A. RNA dependent RNA polymerase may initiate de novo or require a primer. That's correct. Some of you said RNA is synthesized in a three to five prime per direction. It's synthesized in a five to three prime direction. The template is read in a three to five prime direction. As I said, this is always confusing and you're just going to have to remember it. RNA synthesis is always template directed. I mentioned that there are examples of non-templated RNA synthesis that we'll talk about later. All right, nowadays we have sequences of many, many nucleic acid polymerases, not just RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, but uh, RNA-dependent DNA polymerases, reverse transcriptase, DNA-dependent DNA polymerases, and DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. So there are four classes of nucleic acid polymerase that we know of, and these are alignments of the protein sequences of examples of those four classes. And there are conserved regions which indicate that they probably were all derived from a common precursor many, many years ago. And you can see in these, these bars simply represent the, the protein, the amino acid sequence of each kind of polymerase. And the colored regions, red, green, yellow, uh, blue, and purple and blue, uh, these represent areas in the structures that are highly conserved and again were derived from a common precursor. I'm going to show you in a moment what these look like on, a, on an actual structure of a polymerase. <coughs> now here in C, the yellow part, this is the catalytic part of the molecule. That means that is where you take a primer and you add triphosphates onto it and you extend the chain on a template. So that's motif C and within that are amino acid signatures, which you can look at and say, aha, this is a nucleic acid polymerase. So for example, GDD I mentioned before is, is a signature for a plus strand RNA polymerase. And there are also signatures for reverse transcriptases, polymerases of minus strand RNA viruses and so forth. You don't need to know these obviously, but you should just know that in uh, motif C, there, is, there are signatures that you can use to tell if a protein is a polymerase. Now the two Ds in the gliasp asp, the two, two aspartates or the two Ds, those are the two aspartates that coordinate magnesium in the active site to allow catalysis to occur. So it's not surprising that those are conserved in these particular polymerases. And you can see there's also an asp asp in other polymerases as well. Now on this slide is the three-dimensional structure of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of poliovirus. Now, as far as we can tell, all the nucleic acid polymerases have a similar overall structure. They look like a right hand where the palm contains the active site and then there are fingers and thumb domains. And this is shown here. Here would be the palm in the middle with these uh, colored areas and the fingers and thumb are in blue. And on the bottom is the alignment of these four different polymerase, polymerase classes again, so you can see where these motifs are located. So you can see, for example, the yellow is motif C. That's where we have these signatures, including the gliasp asp. And that's the active site right there in the center. And surrounding it are the red and the green conserved areas as well. So you can see on the linear amino acid sequence, the red seems to be far away, but in fact, when the protein folds, it's right next to the active site. Now look at the yellow portions here. You can see there are two beta strands. And then in the loop that joins them, you can just about see uh, two amino acid side chains that are um, highlighted. These are the aspartates. These are part of the GDD. And those are the aspartates that hold the, ma the magnesium ions that are needed for catalysis. We'll see a different view of this in a moment. But again, if you look at structures of DNA polymerases or reverse transcriptases or any of these four groups, they would look very similar, very much like this, uh, because the structure is conserved. Now here's the same polymerase, and we've, we're using a space-filling view. The previous one was only a view of the alpha carbon trace. We took away all the side chains so you could see motifs. When you add all the side chains in and make it space-filling, this is what it looks like. Now we have actually removed some sequence here in the front so you can see what's going on. Now in this view, it's not just the polymerase, but we also have a template 
in cyan and a product in gold. So the template is what's being copied, the product is what's being made. So the template enters the polymerase on one side of the molecule and passes over the active site. The two aspartates at which the magnesium ions are coordinated, they're shown in, in um, magenta, okay, right there in there. So that's where most of the activity is going on. And so what happens is the template will pass through over that and new um, NTPs would be added right here to the growing product strand. So we think the template is coming uh, in the front uh, and then the product is growing <coughs> from the active site right there. And then the, the template comes out the top of the molecule uh, as well. Okay, so it's a complicated arrangement and presumably all of the surrounding residues uh, control uh, how synthesis is regulated and also interaction uh, with other proteins. Yes? Does the polymerase synthesize each new nucleotide it adds on? Or, I mean, where does it get the... The NTPs? Yeah. Uh, so the NTPs are from the cell they're floating around in the cytoplasm, uh, and they probably come in the tunnel at the top here, one by one. And so you have pools of the four NTPs coming in, and what actually happens is, at a very rapid rate, let's say we have the next base ready to be temp uh, synthesized on the template. So let's say it's a, it's a U in the template, so you need to put an A in. What the polymerase done will very rapidly put all four of those in one at a time to see which one is the right one. So it doesn't know, of course, which one to put in. It just samples, but it does it so quickly that it doesn't interfere with the speed of polymerization. So those come from the cell, they diffuse in. They, the polymerase does not make the NTPs. That's made by uh, a lot of other cellular enzymes. Now let's look more closely in on this structure, and we're zooming in on the two aspartates. Again, that motif C is in yellow. And you can see aspartate 338 and 329, because they're right next to each other. 338 and 339. Uh, and these are the two aspartates that would coordinate metal ions, magnesium ions, to allow catalysis to occur. Now also uh, in this region, you can see there are two other motifs in red uh, and in green. And in particular, this one, an, an asp at 238 on the red strand is absolutely critical for discriminating between NTPs and DNTPs. So one interesting question is, why does this enzyme only make RNA? Why doesn't it make DNA? Well, the answer is shown here. It's because of ASP-238. Here is a, a, molecule, a triphosphate uh, coming into the active site, so it's going to eventually be incorporated into a growing chain. It's held there by a number of uh, interactions, with residues, including D238. Now, remember, this is the ribose ring uh, in the DNTP right there, and it's shown in a schematic on the right. There are two hydroxyls at the bottom of that ribose. And this hydroxyl is hydrogen bonding with a residue in D238. If this were DNA, this would be a hydrogen. There would be no oxygen there, so we could not form hydrogen bonds with this D238. So 238 is essential for discriminating between uh, RNA and DNA substrates. In fact, if you change this residue, you can make this enzyme synthesize DNA as well. So that's one of the reasons why this enzyme makes RNA. All right, let's step back now and look at the overall process of making genomes and RNA for a couple of different classes of RNA viruses. So first, we're gonna look at the plus strand RNA viruses. We're going to look at poliovirus, which is a picornavirus, one of our model viruses. And we're going to look at, uh, well, by extension, we're going to look at flavies. We're actually not going to consider their life cycle, but they have the similar strategy as polio. And of course, flavies include Zika virus. Now, for these viruses, you have a plus strand uh, RNA. It replicates through a negative strand intermediate from which you get more plus strands. And importantly, for these viruses, the genome and the mRNA are the same thing. So when you replicate the genome, you're also making mRNA. It's not the case for all viruses. So let's take a look at poliovirus. These are small icosahedral viruses we've talked about a bit, taken into the cell by endocytosis. 
Remember, the receptor is a key molecule in getting the RNA out of the capsid. The RNA then gets into the cytoplasm. It's shown there, the green line. This is a plus-stranded RNA, so it can immediately be engaged by ribosomes, and they can synthesize proteins. Among the proteins that are made is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which takes that input RNA and makes a negative strand of it. So you can see we're going from a single strand to a double-strand RNA, and from that, more plus strands can be made. And then, eventually, when we have capsid proteins made, and we'll talk about this process later, the newly made RNAs can associate with those capsid proteins and you have new virus particles made. All right, so it's a relatively straightforward um, process. The input genome serves both as mRNA and as template for the synthesis of new genomes. And so early in infection, when you're making uh, plus-stranded RNAs, a lot of those can go back into the translation pool so you can make a lot of proteins. And then later on, they get packaged. But here, the genome and the mRNA is exactly the same. And as we'll see later, RNA synthesis of many RNA viruses takes place on little membranous vesicles, they're schematized here, that are induced by virus infection. So they're not present in the uninfected cell. We don't understand why this happens on these vesicles. It may be simply that it's more efficient. It may shield RNAs from innate immunity, as we'll see later. But many RNA viruses do this. Here's a map of the poliovirus genome. Again, plus-stranded RNA. It's about 7,400 nucleotides long. Uh, it has a protein linked to the 5 prime end, and that's because this is the primer for RNA synthesis. I'm gonna show you how this works in a moment. And then we have a 3 prime end with poly A. Uh, poly A is important for mRNA stability and translatability, and most viral mRNAs have that. The RNA encodes one open reading frame. So when this RNA is translated, you get one long protein made. And then it's chopped up by virus proteinases until you get about a dozen viral proteins, including the RNA polymerase, which is called 3D Paul down here. Uh, here's VPG, which is the protein at the 5 prime end. And then there are two proteases encoded in this genome, which clip it up and chop it into these final proteins. So, right, so that's the strategy. You make genomes and mRNAs, and they're exactly the same. This is the genome right here at the top. It's also the mRNA. It is translated to make these proteins. Now let's take a look at that protein at the 5 prime end. It's called VPG, virion protein genome linked. That's what VPG stands for. It's shown here attached to the first base of the RNA. The, the protein is about 20 to 30 amino acids long. And it's linked via a tyrosine, which has a hydroxyl on it. Uh, to the first base, which is a uridine via a phosphodiester linkage. And here's the rest of the genome sequence here, the other 7,400 bases. So if you take virus particles and you extract the RNA from them, they have this protein linked at the 5 prime end. Here's a, another look at the structure of the viral RNA. I showed it to you two slides ago as a squiggly line. But here I'm showing you some of the secondary structures in the RNA that are important for replication. Now, at the 5 prime end, we have VPG, the protein, and right next to it is a clover leaf. It's called a clover leaf. It's simply a structured part of the RNA. There are three uh, stem loop structures there. And that's a, one of the important signals for RNA replication, as you'll see in a moment. The second signal is in the genome itself. It's called CRE for cis-acting RNA element. This is actually a movable element. It can be anywhere in the genome. And for the different polio-related viruses, it's all over the place. And we'll talk about what that does in a moment. And finally, at the 3 prime end, right next to the poly A, there's a pseudonaut. It's a structure which I explained to you before. And these three structures, as you will see in a moment how they function in RNA synthesis, they ensure that the polymerase, when it's made, doesn't copy cellular mRNAs. It only copies viral RNAs. So think about that. A virus infects a cell, which is full of its own mRNAs, right? And a virus makes an RNA polymerase. It only copies poliovirus RNA. It never copies cell RNAs because they don't have these signals. They don't have the pseudonaut, the Cree, and the clover leaf. I mean, mRNAs are polyadenylated, right? But, and so is poliovirus RNA. But 
cell mRNAs are not copied by the virus polymerase because of these signals. All right, so let's now look at how this happens. First, we're going to use VPG as a primer for RNA synthesis. The poliopolymerase is a primer-dependent enzyme. It can't initiate de novo. All right, it's going to use a primer. But before you can use it, uh, the protein as a primer, you have to attach a couple of bases to it. And in fact, what happens is two U's are attached to VPG, and then those two U's base pair with two A's on the template and serve as a primer for synthesis. Where do you get the two U's that are attached to VPG? That's where the Cree comes into play. The Cree is a stem loop structure, which I said can be anywhere in the genome. And in its loop is a series of A residues. And what happens is the polymerase, which is in this image called 3CD, binds to the Cree, and then a molecule of VPG comes in, and then the polymerase copies the A's in the loop of the Cree structure and adds two U's to the VPG. So what we say is that the Cree structure is the site of uridylation of VPG. We have now made a primer of it so that it can serve to prime RNA synthesis. If you take Cree out of the genome, if you cut it out, you will not get RNA synthesis. It's absolutely essential for that process. So here's how RNA synthesis happens. It's very unusual. It happens on a circularized RNA. Even though I'm showing you the genome of this virus as a linear molecule, when RNA synthesis occurs, the RNA ends come together. So here's the five prime end with the clover leaf structure. And here's the polyadenylated three prime end. Remember, VPG UU is synthesized on the Cree, and somehow it makes its way to the three prime end. Now, in the cell, there are proteins called poly A binding proteins, PABPs. They're shown right here, PABP. This is a cell protein, but it turns out it binds the poly A tail of polio RNA, and it also binds uh, a molecule of polymerase that is sitting bound to this clover leaf structure. And that makes the RNA circular. And then this polymerase will hop onto the three prime end uh, of the genome where there's a VPG primer sitting. And it will start to extend and make a copy and eventually makes a full length negative strand copy of the plus strand that's shown at the bottom. All right, so this whole thing happens on a circularized molecule. The VPG is sitting there. The polymerase uh, is at the clover leaf. So it's kind of unusual. Polymerase is sitting at the five prime end of this RNA, and it needs that in order to initiate at the three prime end. And the polymerase, again, here called 3CD Pro, uh, goes to the primer and initiates RNA synthesis. So the polymerase in the middle is shown as this blue U molecule. It's bound to the VPG now, and it's going to extend the template. So it's a primer dependent enzyme, and it also has to have a circularized template, very unusual. So now you see the, the way the VPG UU works. We've talked about how that was made as well. Now I mentioned that many RNA viruses in the infected cell, the RNA synthesis occurs on membranous vesicles. And these are shown here for three different positive strand RNA viruses. So on the top is an electron micrograph of an uninfected HeLa cell and a poliovirus infected HeLa cell. You can see all the small membranous vesicles there that are not present in the uninfected cell. So the virus does this. It co-opts the lipid synthesis machinery of the cell. It redirects uh, how lipids are incorporated and makes these small vesicles so that it can make its RNA on the surface. Similarly, flaviviruses do the same thing. Here's a flavivirus infected cell on the left. You can see lots of these lipid vesicles. These seem to be in the ER. And there's a virus particle shown by the arrow. In this uh, panel on the right, the viruses are colorized. And you can see the lipids uh, as the spheres right there, the lipid vesicles. And finally, on the right, coronavirus infected cell, very large vesicles. Again, on the surface of these, RNA synthesis occur. So it doesn't happen just floating around in the cytoplasm. The RNA synthesis, the polymerase, the template, the product all is wrapped around these vesicles. And again, we don't understand why that would be. Okay, our next question, which is a part of the poliovirus replication strategy? A, the production of subgenomic mRNAs. B, de novo without primer initiation of RNA synthesis. C, circularization of template 
for initiation of RNA synthesis or all of the above? <clears throat> okay, uh, most of you, 70% said C, circularization of template. That's certainly true. I just told you about that. Uh, it does not synthesize without a primer. I just also explained to you how VPGUU is the primer and how we synthesize that. Uh, and it does not produce subgenomic mRNAs. I remember I made a point of saying the RNA, the genome, and the mRNA are the same molecule. So there's no subgenomic mRNA. So that's why only uh, number C is correct. All right, let's look at some other strategies for RNA synthesis. Now on the right here, we're going to look at another kind of plus strand RNA virus, which we haven't really mentioned before. These are alpha viruses. So they have, they are typically uh, arthropod-borne viruses. Um, and they have a plus-stranded RNA genome, very much like the Flavi and the Picornas. But the reason I want to show you this is because they make a subgenomic mRNA. So they make, they, the plus strand comes in the cell, some proteins are made, but not all the proteins that it encodes, and so a subgenomic mRNA has to be made to do that. So these viruses are enveloped, they bind cell receptors, they're taken in by endocytosis, Low pH catalyzed fusion releases the RNA into the cell. And that RNA can immediately be engaged by ribosomes because it's plus stranded. Of course, these are naked plus RNAs in the genome, in the particle. Uh, and proteins are made, but these proteins are only part of the coding capacity of the genome. Turns out, though, that those proteins constitute the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. Uh, those then recognize the viral plus strand RNA that's come in. They make a negative strand. They make, they make more plus strands from that. But importantly, from these negative strands, they also make a small RNA, a subgenomic RNA. Subgenomic simply means it's not the whole genome. So polio doesn't have a subgenomic RNA because all the RNAs are full-length copies of the genome. This little RNA here, after number five, is a subgenomic RNA because as you'll see in the next figure, it's only part of the genome. And from that subgenomic RNA, we make additional proteins which are needed to complete replication. These happen to be the structural proteins of the virus. So let's zoom in on this strategy here. In the middle, in green, is the viral RNA. It is capped and it is polyadenylated. Looks just like a cellular mRNA. And the ribosomes engage it and they translate as much as they can. They make the RNA polymerase, as you can see in blue here. But there, there is a stop codon right at the end of NSP4. And translation stops there, and it can't go any further. But there are lots of coding potential in the latter half of the genome. And so that's why we have to make a subgenomic mRNA to access it. Fortunately, the virus made a polymerase, so it could copy the plus into a minus strand. If it didn't encode a polymerase in this part, it would be dead, right? Because it could never go beyond this. So this polymerase copies uh, the plus strand into a minus strand, and then it makes a subgenomic mRNA starting at this red arrow. You can see it's subgenomic encodes for the proteins, the structural proteins, the capsid, the glycoproteins, and so forth uh, from the three prime end of the genome. Now, why this has evolved to be different from the Flavi and Picorna strategies is anyone's guess. And all I can tell you is it works. There are many ways to get to the same endpoint, and whatever is the mechanism is fine. But I wanted to show you that as an example of a subgenomic mRNA. Now, obviously, that subgenomic mRNA only encodes a few of the viral proteins. And that's why you have to still uh, translate the rest of the genome. All right, those are plus strand RNA viruses. Let's move on to minus strand RNA viruses. Now, again, these are all going to have a polymerase in the virus particle because the minus strands cannot be translated. So we're going to look at two different kinds of minus strand RNA genomes, what we call unimolecular. They're in one molecule, like the Pocornas and the Flavies that we've talked about. And then we're going to talk about segmented genomes, influenza virus and rheoviruses. Start with a unimolecular negative strand RNA genome. This is vesicular stomatitis virus, or VSV, the bullet-shaped particles that we have looked at structurally. Uh, these viruses bind cell receptors. They're taken into endosomes. Low pH catalyzed fusion releases 
the RNA into the cell. And remember, this is a nucleocapsid because it's in an envelope. It's negative strand RNA bound with proteins. From this negative strand, the viral polymerase, which is bound to the negative strand, synthesizes subgenomic mRNAs. And it makes a number of them, as you can see here, one, two, three, four, five. Five subgenomic RNAs, mRNAs. All right, they're all smaller than the input genome, and each of them encodes a protein that the virus needs to make new particles, including more polymerase, that's the L protein, and that polymerase could take the uh, negative strands and make plus strands out of them, and then more negative strands to make genomes. Uh, and other structural proteins that go to building virus particles. So this is an example of a strategy involving subgenomic mRNAs. And we're going to look at now how these are made and how the virus decides when to stop making those and when to make full-length genomes, because that's an important decision. So again, here's the virus particle, the actual cryo-EM structure on the upper left in our schematic that we've been using uh, on the right. It's an enveloped virus with glycoproteins in the envelope. Now here at the middle of the slide is the negative strand RNA genome, a rather long single negative strand. Again, in the, in the virus particle, it's covered with proteins. When this RNA comes into the cell in the virus particle, the polymerase, which is in the particle and is shown in the schematic as spheres and ovals, polymerase is sim synthesizes one, two, three, sorry, one, two, three, four, five mRNAs subgenomic mRNAs from this negative strand. And you can see each of them encodes a different protein. There's a little leader made at the three prime end of the RNA we don't have to worry about. How does this happen? All right, so in this slide we're gonna explore how you make mRNAs and then how you make genomes. Because early in infection, mostly you're making mRNAs because you wanna make a lot of protein to get the whole infection started. So here's in the middle of this slide, the second from the top is the negative strand RNA genome, complex with proteins. The little circles represent the nucleocapsid protein which coat this whole genome. And at the three prime end is a polymerase. This polymerase comes in, it actually comes in with a particle and makes five subgenomic mRNAs which are shown at the top. And those encode the proteins. These, pro these mRNAs are made in a very unique way. The polymerase makes the first one, then it stops. And then it initiates and makes the second one and stops and so forth all the way down the line. And you have to make the first before the second, before the third, before the fourth, and before the fifth. You never make them independently. Now, after this go goes on for a while, a couple of hours, you start to make viral proteins from those mRNAs. One of the proteins is the nucleoprotein, right there, made by the encoded by the smallest RNA. The nucleoprotein is the protein that encapsidates the negative strand RNA genome. As levels of NP protein rise, that causes a switch from mRNA synthesis to full length positive strand synthesis. The nucleoprotein you could view as an anti-terminator. Instead of the polymerase stopping at the end of each mRNA, when it has nucleoprotein bound to the template, it keeps going and makes a full length plus strand. So the switch, the signal for switching from mRNA synthesis to full length plus strands is the nucleoprotein. And from that you can make more minus strands and these get put into new virions. Okay, so this is a key point here. You cannot make a new virus from mRNAs because they're too short and they're not linked together. The only way you can make a new virus is to have full length negative strands. So you have to have a full length plus strand to serve as the template. And that's the switch for this synthesis. Now let's take a look in a little more detail of what this polymerase is doing when it's chugging down the negative strand template. Here's the three prime end of the minus strand RNA. We're just looking at a few genes at one end. The polymerase starts making that first N mRNA. And there in the third line, you see nmRNA is made. Then the polymerase stops. It terminates. There's a region between the two, the, the mRNA coding areas called the intergenic region. There are signals in there that tell the polymerase to stop. It stops. You make a mature mRNA. And then it starts to make the next mRNA and so forth. It makes that and it stops and initiates again. And again, this is an obligatory sequence of events. It can't jump to the L, the last protein, 
uh, the last mRNA on the genome and initiate there. It has to go through all the previous ones first before it can get to the last one. Now, each time the polymerase stops at the intergenic region, it also polyadenylates each mRNA. Remember, mRNAs are typically polyadenylated at the 3' end. And so let's look at how that happens. This is the same uh, sequence of events, except we're zoomed in just at the intergenic region. So we've just made the N mRNA, and here's the polymerase. It has stopped. There's a signal here for stopping. But you can see there's a stretch of U's on the template RNAs, right? There's an AUAC, then a bunch of U's. And for reasons that are not clear to us, when the polymerase stops, it starts to stutter. It makes a couple of A's and more A's and more A's and more A's until you got 100 or 200 A's, which constitutes a poly A tail. And then presumably it gets fed up with this stuttering and stops synthesizing and moves on to the next mRNA. So you have termination, you have slippage and recopying of this 7U sequence to get a 200 length poly A sequence. Uh, that mRNA is then released, and then the polymerase starts again to make the next mRNA. You can see it's already put a cap structure on it, and it's making the next mRNA. Obligatory start-stop sequence from the left to the right end of the genome, and at each, at each intergenic region, the signals for polyadenylation are located. So again, these are small segments of the genome. These mRNAs are subgenomic. They would not reconstitute an entire virus. So you have to figure out how to get from making mRNA to full length plus strands. And that's the N protein, the NP protein, as I showed you in the previous slide. OK, so that is an example of a negative strand virus that has one RNA as its genome unimolecular. We're going to look at flu now, which has a negative strand genome, which is segmented. But some of the principles are the same. The switch from mRNA to genome to full length plus strand synthesis is similar as we just talked about. It's going to be catalyzed by a nucleocapsid protein that coats the RNA genome. Now, here we have flu entering the cell. We talked about this in some detail last time. P low pH mediated fusion. Uh, the RNA, the nucleocapsid, is released and it goes into the nucleus. This is very unusual for an RNA virus to go into the nucleus. Most of them stay in the cytoplasm. But this one goes in the nucleus. Uh, here's one of the eight RNA segments here. It's immediately copied into mRNA uh, by the polymerase that comes in with the particle. And some of these mRNAs are shown below. You can see they're capped and they are polyadenylated. Those RNAs, of course, then go out in the cytoplasm to be translated to make the viral proteins that you need. At the same time, you have to replicate the genome. So at some point, you have to stop making mRNAs and make full-length plus strands. Now, as you'll see in a moment, the mRNAs, the reason you need to switch is because the mRNAs, just like those of VSV, are not full-length copies of the genome. They're, they are slightly short. So at some point, you have to switch to making full-length plus strands one of which is shown between steps 11 and 12. You can use those to make uh, more genome segments, negative strand segments. Those can go on to make more messages. But then later, they'll go on to be inserted into newly synthesized virus particles. So a lot of this, the same issues we had with VSV, the only difference here is that there are eight segments and a couple of, of minor things that are quite interesting, which we'll touch on. So again, here's a schematic of the particle. We've been looking at this diagram on the upper right, and I like this one on the upper left. This is a, a computer-generated model, and you can see very nicely the spikes on the membrane and the, the ribonucleoproteins all coiled up inside of the particle. Again, there are eight genome segments, eight negative-stranded genome segments. You can see them listed here. From each one, the virion-associated polymerase makes an mRNA, which is the next line. You can see the green capped and polyadenylated mRNAs. Those are made by the viral polymerase as the RNA gets in the nucleus. And each of those encodes at least one protein, as you can see here. Some of these segments encode more than one protein. Um, there is some splicing that goes on to give you different mRNAs so you can encode a different protein. Uh, in this, this second segment here, there are alternate reading frames. We don't need to concern ourselves with that at the moment. 
main point here is that we have the genome and early on we have messenger RNAs. But as I'll show you in a moment, those messenger RNAs are not complete copies of the RNA segments. So we have to figure out a way of how to get around that. So here's an example using one segment. So the second line from the top is the negative strand genome RNA that comes in with the particle. It's coated with protein. And from that, you have to, the virus has to make mRNA. The viral RNA polymerase that comes in with the particle has to make mRNA. This is a primer-dependent enzyme. The enzyme that makes mRNA is primer-dependent. What is the primer? For polio, remember, the primer was VPGUU. Uh, for VSV, by the way, I didn't mention a primer because it's primer-independent. You don't need a primer for VSV RNA synthesis. For flu, the primer is a piece of cellular mRNA. And that's shown here, host M7GP primer. Host mRNAs are capped. That's what the little blue box is. And what the viral polymerase does, it has a protein associated with it, which is an endonuclease. It grabs host mRNAs and it cuts them near the 5' end and uses the pieces that are left to serve as primers. And so here we have this 5' capped fragment. It's from a host mRNA. It can be any mRNA. There's no specificity. It's serving as a primer for mRNA synthesis. So every flu mRNA has about 12 or 14 nucleotides of sequence at its 5' end. It's colored differently there to show you that, which is from the cell. It's non-viral. <clears throat> and we have an mRNA made from that segment, and it's polyadenylated, but it falls short of the, of the 5' prime end of the negative strand template. There's about 20 bases missing. So the mRNA is not a complete copy of the genome segment. So that means you have to figure out how to restore that sequence. How do you copy the genome segment without losing sequence and without having this extra stuff at the 5' prime end because you couldn't make virus from that, okay? Just like VSV, after the mRNAs are made and you get protein made, levels of the NP protein, which is the nucleocapsid protein for flu that coats the incoming RNA, as soon as you get enough of that made, when the polymerase starts making a copy of this genome, the NP will bind and prevent termination 20 nucleotides uh, short of the 3 prime N. So you now get a full length plus strand by virtue of having NP protein around, and that can be copied to make more minus strand. Interestingly, the, the synthesis of minus strands is unprimed. It's not primer dependent at all. It's a weird enzyme. It's got lots of specificities. It can make messenger RNAs that are, cap that are primer dependent. Uh, it can make full length plus strands without using a primer, and it can make full length negative strands uh, without using a primer as well. All right, so again, the key here, the messenger RNAs are not really fully viral. They have extra sequences at the five prime end. They're missing the three prime 20 nucleotides. So you have to get a way to make sure you copy that from end to end. You have to make a full length plus strand. This molecule here, the third one down, is a full length plus copy of the negative strand. And when you copy that again, you get a full length genome negative strand. All right, so there is a mechanism for making mRNAs and another mechanism involving the NP protein for making uh, full-length genomes. And that's very important because the mRNAs on their own wouldn't allow you to make an infectious virus. Last thing I want to show you, two things I want to show you with flu. First is the priming of mRNA synthesis. Remember I told you that the mRNA of flu is primed with a little piece of cellular mRNA. So here's the three prime end of the negative strand RNA from influenza virus. So the enzyme, the polymerase of the virus has an endonuclease activity. It takes a messenger RNA which is capped. It will cleave it about 13 bases from the five prime end and it will use this 13 base primer fragment as a primer to make uh, mRNA. And that's shown at the bottom here. So in gray, we have our 13 base fragment derived from host cell mRNAs. And that is now linked to the uh, mRNA sequence shown in green. We call this cap snatching. It is stealing caps from the host to use as a primer. So, 
So far we've talked about polio using VPG as a primer, the need to uridylate it. Flu uses a piece of cellular mRNA as a primer for mRNA synthesis. So that's the five prime end, that's the priming step. Remember at the three prime end, the three prime end of the message falls short of the template, but it's also polyadenylated. And I want to show you how that works because it's a really neat mechanism. At the top you see three spheres. Those are three subunits of the flu RNA polymerase. One of those is the endonuclease that chops the caps off of cellular messages. Now what we're looking at here is a negative strand RNA template in, in kind of the olive green color. Here's the five prime end is attached to the polymerase. Uh, and then we are making an mRNA, a capped mRNA, which is shown in green. And so here this uh, oval uh, purple uh, red site is the active site of the enzyme. And what's happening here is the template, the negative strand template, is being threaded through the polymerase. It's being pulled through uh, as it's being copied to make an mRNA. Now, as you can see, at some point, it runs out of room. It, the five prime end of the negative strand is attached. So when all of the negative strand has been pulled through the active site, the polymerase can't go any further because it's not moving on the template. And it just so happens that at that point, there's a stretch of U's on the negative strand. And guess what? The polymerase starts stuttering. It starts stuttering because it can't move along the RNA template. It's stuck at this U stretch. And it ends up putting one or 200 A's on the messenger RNA until it falls off. And then it's a polyadenylated messenger RNA. So very much like VSV, you had that intergenic U stretch. The polymerase stuttered and made an A. Here, you have a, a, a restriction in the movement of the template at a U stretch, which also causes polyadenylation. All right, last question for today. How are influenza virus and VSV RNA synthesis similar? The switch from mRNA to genome synthesis is controlled by an RNA binding protein. Polyadenylation occurs at a short stretch of U. Viral mRNAs are shorter than minus genome RNAs, all of the above. All right, most of you got all of the above, which is right. These are all correct. RNA binding proteins can control the switch. Polyadenylation occurs at that U residue. You get stuttering. And the viral mRNAs are shorter than the genome, the negative genome RNA for both of these negative strand viruses. The last thing I want to tell you about is how double-stranded RNA viruses replicate. These are the real viruses. In the particle is a duplex RNA. One of the strands is a message, and the other is a negative strand. But ribosomes can't access that plus strand. So uh, up, upon entry into the cell, the virus carries in it a polymerase. The uh, polymerase makes mRNAs from the minus strand. They're capped, and they're translated into protein. When the new genomes are needed, new double-stranded genomes are needed, those mRNAs are copied uh, to make them double-stranded by the same polymerase. Now this is an interesting process because it largely takes place within the viral capsid. You remember we talked about how these real viruses are double-shelled particles and that the outer shell is stripped off so that the core can poke through the endosome and get into the cytoplasm. So that core now has the double-stranded RNA segments, and it has polymerase in it as well. So those cores begin to make mRNAs. The mRNAs come out of the turrets, those, those structures at each five-fold axis of symmetry. And you can see the mRNAs diagrammed coming out here. They're capped. Uh, they're, they're light green in color. Those mRNAs can be translated to make proteins, which are these bars here. Uh, the proteins can then assemble uh, into new particles along with mRNAs in them. And there's also RNA polymerase in the particle. It makes the RNAs double-stranded. And now those particles can go through the cycle again. They can make more mRNAs in them, which are extruded, as you can see here in the center. And eventually you get full uh, particle, double-shelled particles made, which leave the cell. So the enzyme is always in a particle. The RNA polymerase of this virus is always in a particle, whether it's the incoming particle or newly assembled particles. So mRNA synthesis never happens uh, in the cytoplasm. So here are the particles we've talked about, the virion, the infectious subviral particle, uh, with a bit of the outer shell stripped off, and then the core, which has only the inner 
shell, and that's what goes in the cytoplasm. And those double-stranded RNAs, which are lined up here, are <coughs> copied to make mRNAs. The mRNAs come out of the turrets at each five-fold axis, and in the cytoplasm, they give rise to proteins. And so this is a very unusual synthesis because it's all happening in the particle. So here, the genome never really goes into the cell per se. It always stays within the virus particle. So here is a reconstruction by cryo-EM of real virus particles, which show you them in the action of extruding mRNA. So these are just the inner core particle, which are incubated in vitro with triphosphates. Uh, and then the cryo-EM structure was done. And in this, and in this uh, view at the upper left, you can see little bits of RNA coming out at each five-fold axis. And here on the right is a larger magnification of that. So the RNA is made inside. We think that the polymerase is attached to the five prime end of each double-stranded segment. And right near each five-fold axis, the RNA is made. It extrudes uh, through the turret, which is shown in blue and yellow here. And the mRNA comes out and goes into the cell. So we think each segment is attached to the polymerase uh, via the cap. And we think the polymerase is situated under each five-fold axis. Remember how many 12, how many five-fold axes there are in an icosahedral particle? 12, yes, I just told you. There are never any more than 12 segments in these viruses. And it may be that's as many polymerases as you can get at each five-fold axis, so that limits you in the number of segments. Quite interesting. All right, one more point. This is non-templated RNA synthesis. Everything we've told you so far is about having an RNA template and copying it to make an RNA. There are a number of examples in the RNA world where bases are added, but they're not templated. And one of them is in the paramyxoviruses. We talked a little bit about Sendai virus early on because they have nuclear capsids like TMV enclosed in an envelope. An example of this virus in, in terms of human disease would be measles and mumps virus. These have a negative strand RNA genome, and they produce subgenomic mRNAs very much like VSV. There's a polymerase in the particle. The RNA gets in the cell. Subgenomic mRNAs are produced. Each of these mRNAs encodes a protein, with the exception of this second mRNA, which you can see encodes at least three proteins, the P, the V, and the C. The reason it encodes more than one is because there's editing going on. The polymerase is adding extra bases, which shifts the open reading frame and allows you to make a different protein. Now, how does that happen? So on the left, we have in, on the top of each uh, image here, the negative strand RNA. And on the bottom is the mRNA sequence. So the top template, three to five prime, the polymerase is making an mRNA. And you can see right there, uh, this sequence, four A's, five A's and two G's, that would give rise to one protein. But this, se this sequence has a very unusual structure. And sometimes the, um, the uh, mRNA that's being made slips back. And the polymerase doesn't realize this and it inserts an extra G. So here you see we've made A, G, G, but that second G has slipped back, so now you have a little bulge, and the polymerase keeps going, so the, the net result is you insert an extra G. So that's called non-templated RNA synthesis. It's not specified, that extra G is not specified in the template, right? There are only uh, three Cs here, so the, the mRNA should only have four Gs, but it, three Gs, but it ends up having four. So the effect of that is to change the open reading frame down, downstream of that non-templated addition. So if you look in panel B, uh, the normal mRNA is shown at the top in green. It encodes uh, the protein below it. But when you add an extra G at the editing site, you change the reading frame so the C-terminus of that protein is different. So it has a different function, in fact. So editing is one way to get proteins, uh, different proteins from one mRNA that have different functions. Now, it turns out that Ebola virus also depends on RNA editing in a similar fashion. One of its mRNAs, shown here, uh, encodes the viral glycoprotein. Now, the particles of Ebola virus, of course, are filamentous. They have a negative strand RNA genome, very much like that of measles, which I just showed you. It's a nucleocapsid. It's got protein coating it. And in the 
a membrane of the virus particle, there's a glycoprotein, which the virus needs to attach to protein to, to receptors on the cell membrane. That glycoprotein is encoded by the GP gene. Trans uh, mRNA synthesis of the GP gene normally gives you a protein that is secreted. It's not bound to the membrane. It's only when you get editing, the addition of extra nucleotides at the editing site, does it change the C-terminus of the protein. So now it has a membrane anchor and it stays in the virus particle. So if it were not for editing, Ebola virus would not have a membrane like a protein and it would not be infectious. So there are many examples like this where editing non, the addition of non-templated bases gives you expanded coding capacity. When you think about it, it makes sense because compared to our genome, viral genomes are pretty small. So any mechanism that they can use to expand the number of proteins that they have, including uh, this one, RNA editing is what's used. 